For the past weeks of prayer, we had songs, theme songs, and appeal songs composed by our students. So there's a lot. Actually, we have a CD out of uh, the songs in the past weeks of prayer. I don't know whether you have a copy. So why weeks of prayer? We pray every day. We study the Bible every day. Why special weeks like this? Did you ever think about it? I think the answer lies also with our understanding of the Sabbath. Every day we meet God, but on the Sabbath we meet and worship Him in a special way. So two times a year, we have weeks of prayer, special days where our students can find time and special effort for prayer and reflection. And we believe that the weeks of prayer will bring a special blessing from the Lord. Do you believe so? How many of you this morning had been praying for this week of prayer and excited about it? Can you raise your hands? Oh, praise the Lord. And we believe that the Lord will bless us in a special way this week. I mentioned already that we have been looking for some time for the person who will lead us in the study of God's Word in this week of prayer. And we have prayed. I work specially with the uh, uh, director for spiritual development as we scout around for a speaker. And one of the things that we have been praying about for AUP is that the revival and reformation we have been working and praying for will not just find uh, fruits or results in terms of individuals giving their lives to God, but especially you, our students, and our faculty and staff will have a renewed sense of mission that we are here for a purpose. We are here to finish God's work and to serve Him. So, for this year, we have been praying that we will find somebody who can lead us in the week of prayer who has a strong sense of mission, who will lead our campus in a renewed understanding of what is God's plan for our life. What is the purpose that God gave us talents and opportunities and experiences? How do we use it for His service? And today, it's a pleasure for me to introduce to you our speaker. Our speaker is pastor, or maybe doctor, we should say, Joshua Shin. His wife, Jane, was introduced to us last Sabbath. Pastor Joshua has two kids. One, the youngest, is still a college student like you. Christina is a nursing student at Southern Adventist University, Tennessee, the United States. His eldest, named Samuel, just got married, and he's finishing his PhD. It's a joint, a combined degree for Doctor of Medicine and PhD in Medicine in Loma Linda University. Joshua, as he mentioned last Sabbath, he was my roommate when we were upgrading in apartment B. We lived there for two years. Was senior pastor of Jongdong Central Church in Korea for six years. Then he was chaplain of Samyuk University for three years. Then he, was, he served for nine years at the Northern Asia Pacific Division as youth director. You see, Pastor Joshua is a specialist in youth ministry and missions. While the director of the division, he started his work upgrading for his doctor of ministry in leadership. And after being youth director, he went to the United States and finished that degree from Andrews University. He was senior pastor of Milpitas Church in San Jose, California for two years. Last year, he was elected by the two divisions to be the sixth director of the 1,000 Missionary Movement. Young people, we believe that the Lord has sent us a person today, this week, who loves young people, especially 
who is passionate about your role, our role, in fulfilling the mission of the church. As you will hear his voice, he's very good in music too. So we pray that the Lord will bless us as we begin the week of prayer. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. We are going to teach you our theme song for this week of prayer. It's entitled, That Glorious Day is Coming. The praise team will be singing the, uh, the first song. Then the second time is, may I request the congregation to sing with us.
to sing with us. to please rise for our opening song, the theme song. Thank you. 
It is now time for our season of prayer. And just before we enter our session of prayer, I just want to share the prayer focus as well as a few passages. The prayer focus is spiritual awakening. Indeed, we as the people of God need to awake from our spiritual slumber. In her book, Review and Herald, March 22, 1887, Ellen White wrote these words. There is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, there would never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of time. And in Revelation 2, verse 2 to 5, it reads, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love, work, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Just before pastor uh, will pray, our choristers will lead us in song, and as the song plays, may I invite everyone, if possible, to kneel, and then pastor will pray, after which you will be given the chance to pray, individually for three minutes. After the three minutes is up, um, our choristers will again lead us in song, and then pastor will pray again.
eternal God, our Creator, loving Heavenly Father. It is comforting to know and understand that we are here in this world because you have created us. Today, at this very hour, we humbly come before your throne of grace. We are unworthy. We are full of sins, wicked and hard-headed. But we thank you that in spite of who we are, you have sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for us to have hope and redemption. Today, O oh God, we breathe, we live, we move because of your grace. Help us, dear Lord, that today as we will start this week of spiritual emphasis, help us to be refreshed spiritually. Help us that we may be able to have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Oftentimes, O oh God, we forget all about you. We do our own things. We try to manage our life. But we understand that without you, we can do nothing. So today, dear Lord, please be gracious to us. Send your Holy Spirit to work in our midst today. Help us, O oh God, to respond positively to the pleadings of your Holy Spirit that before the end of this week, even before the end of this first day of week of prayer, our lives will be awakened, that we'll be able to recognize you as our Creator and God, our Savior and King, that we'll be able to make that right decision to fully surrender and commit our lives to you, O oh God. I would like to pray for these young people, for all of us here. We have come in this place wounded. We have our own individual burdens. O oh God, we cannot carry it. We will surely fail and we will surely be lost without you. Today, be merciful to us, our Creator God. Extend your grace to us. We are unworthy. But thank you for your unmerited favor that in spite of who we are, with open arms, you accept us just as we are. And today, as we open your lives to you, our hearts, O oh God, as we pour out our burdens, please be merciful to us and be gracious to us. Please listen to the cry of our hearts, O oh God, as we open our hearts to you this morning.
O God, our Creator, we could not see you physically, but deep in our hearts we could feel that you are there. You love us so much that, and you are so concerned about our welfare. And this morning, O oh God, please help us to hold your hands by faith. Transform our lives, O oh God, through the, your grace and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Bless all of us in this campus, dear Lord. Help us to be more like Jesus that through our influence, people will be able to see you in our lives. Bless the program this morning, O oh God. And may your Holy Spirit continue to dwell in our hearts. Hold our heads, O oh God, as we live day by day. And help us to become more like Jesus. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Show us. 
Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you. We want to praise you. And we want to give you glory. Safely through another year, another semester, you have brought us to another week of spiritual revival. We want to give you glory, O oh Lord. You are calling upon us once again as the people of God in these last days to seek the face of our maker. We praise you, Father, for the final exodus you are preparing us for, you are empowering us for, you are strengthening us for. Mighty God, may we not carry any weight or burden or obstacle that would hinder us from walking forth, marching forward in this journey. We want to thank you, Lord. You have anointed a manservant to come and be instrumental in your hands. I beg with you in the name of Jesus, may you strip him of all self and allow Jesus to be magnified in our midst. We pray through this whole week, your manservant, I know, we know, will be attacked but we give you glory for greater is the God who is in him than he that is in the world. We claim victory this week, Lord, even as this week begins. We claim victory for many who will surrender their lives, for individuals who will stand and give their lives to Jesus through baptism. I pray in the name of Jesus that God and Amen. God alone be glorified in our midst. Amen. Thank you so much, God, for hearing our prayers. Thank you so much for being the answer to our prayers. Thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Well, many of you are wondering how come Pastor Joshua's chin got too old after one day. I met you last Sabbath, and I was quite young, right, looking young, and this morning, very old man. I'm sorry to tell you that I've been wearing a wig for the last 12 years. Uh, but this is the reality of the human beings, you know. After reaching certain high point of the life and going down and fading away, we are getting weaker and feeble. <laughs> but anyway, that's the life that God has given us. By the way, this morning, you made me so happy. The total silence, a godly calmness amongst this wonderful congregation, which I've not used to, you know, experience in the schools like this. More than 2,000 young people are gathering, but, you know, when we kneel down and pray, I felt such a, a spiritual atmosphere in this very room. And I'd like to thank you for your spiritual uh, join and also support for this week of prayer. Isn't it great that we can break this new day with the Word of God? All in the morning, 7.30. I've been serving preaching ministry to many schools, but I've never had this early, you know, the morning session. And as we end up, I heard that we will be having another evening session for all you. So I'm greatly thankful for this wonderful week of prayer. Okay. 새는 세장 안에 산다. It's Korean language. It means birds in a cage. In Ganon, Sejang Anesanda. Man in three different cages. This was my image just last Sabbath. Exactly the same suit, same necktie, and same white shirt. And as you greet out of the, you know, this room, some of them, they said, Pastor, you are so foggy. <laughs> I said, thank you. And you know, for the last 12 years, when the people are looking at me, instead of getting eye match, eye to eye, the exact height, but you know, they're rather looking at me with a little higher height, little above my eye here, and they're continually talking at me, but, ah, Pastor Sheen, but, you know, and I knew they're very much interested in my new hairstyle. <laughs> so anyway, this is the solo photo that I sent to uh, Pastor Jay Zell, introducing me as the week of prayer speaker. But I told you, Inganan Sejang Ane Sanda. Men live in three different cages. Do you know what they're three different cages? Number one, Pojang. Uh, some of you from China, you, you may read that Chinese letter. Packing. All of you and I are packed. Packed by what? Dress, barong, shoes, pants, makeup. And wija, disguise. Although you are angry, but you know, oh, okay, good morning. How are you? You are so angry with somebody and you are really down. But I'm okay, fine, thank you. Disguise. And the third one we call kwajang, exaggeration. We are living in these three different cages, human beings. I have, I'm still living in maybe, you know, just last Sabbath, when you see me, I was packed, disguised, maybe exaggerated in terms of my being, my appearance to you, and maybe many other things. But this morning, throughout this week, somehow I'd like to expose myself as a real being. 
pastor. And I told you, my son is 25 years old, got married, my daughter is 23, just like you guys. So I want to approach you as a kind of father, maybe spiritual mentor. And may the Lord bless us as we go on this. Somehow people are living in the cage. Cities and countries and societies are living in the cage. But Jesus said, be free. Come out of the cage. The cage of sin. The cage of sadness. The cage of fading away because of the result of sin. So this morning, my desire, as I open this new chapter of week of prayer in 2016 for AUP, you and I must be free coming out of this cage. And I truly hope the Holy Spirit come upon us and He will transform us in a very powerful way. Sound, please. Sound, this one. The land God has given to the people of Israel. Now you just have seen the book of Genesis. Before we go into the final Exodus, the second book of the Bible, we need to have a little review of how these people, the people of Israel, got started their journey with the Lord. So this morning I want to have a little review of the book of Genesis, then we will go into the book of Genesis. Uh, the Exodus. All right. If you know the question answers, please raise your hands and I will collect your names then in the afternoon or tomorrow I will give a special basalubong, a gift. Okay? Number one, Abram was how many years old when he left Haran for Bethel? How many of you do you know? Nobody, no theology major. Yes, you. How? Speak loud. Huh? 75. Correct. Okay, I want to get your name. Let us read it together. Ready, go. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Okay, very good. This is the map you can understand, you see. He was born in the city of Ur, which was the major city of Mesopotamia. Run by this two river, the ancient, you know, civilization area. River of Tigris and Euphrates, a beautiful land. And he moved about 600 miles, which is about 1,000 kilometers. He moved first from city, oh, please do not show me, just only the PowerPoint, okay. From these two here, and then there he stayed several more years until his father Terah died. Then God is now pushing him away again. 
Abraham, I told you going to the land of Canaan. You stopped here so many years. So he was pushed by God and he had a second travel from Haran to land of Canaan, Bethel, the house of God. All right. So this was the answer. And now the second question. Abraham was how many years old and Sarah was how many years old when they had Isaac? Any question? Any answer? Ladies, so easy. You learn in the kindergarten. Nobody? Again, he's from China, I know. Very good, correct, again, double price. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. The 1717 says, Abraham was 100 years old. Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? That's right, 190, 10 years apart. All right, number three. Isaac was how many years old when his wife Rebecca had how many sons? All right. Again, Mr. China? <laughs> Any other? Okay, since time is running fast, so let me go. Genesis 25, 26 says, After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Isaac married to beautiful lady, gorgeously beautiful lady, Rebecca, when he was 40. Another means for 20 years of marriage, they had no son, no children. They prayed hard, just like Abraham and Sarah. Finally, God gave them two sons, twin brothers, Jacob and Esau. Number four, Jacob was how many years old when he ran away from his brother Esau? This is very, very difficult question. So I put the question mark and you will get the answer. Your theology major students, maybe you may learn this uh, today. And number five, Jacob spent how many years at Uncle Laban's house? How many of you do know that? You know the story of Jacob, right? How many years? Ladies, yes, there. Fourteen, one, four, sorry, wrong. <laughs> you know the Leah and Rachel and plus some more years. One more time. Yes, you. Twenty years. That's right. You will get the prize. God bless you. Genesis 31. I have been with you for 20 years now. But you know, his uncle Laban changed his wages more than 10 times. Okay, anyway, the next one. You know, by the way, the uncle Laban's character. This is very interesting, you know, as you study the Bible, you try to dig a little deeper. He had two daughters, as you know that, Leah and Rachel. Do you know the meaning of these two daughters? Very strange. Number one, cow. Number two, sheep. I have a beautiful daughter. My daughter is Miss Universe because she's my daughter. <laughs> yeah, she's really beautiful. By the way, you know, as a father, how can you give a name cow? Meow. Or Money-oriented man. Only money, 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 money. That's why, of course, at the time, cow and sheep, you know, camels, and you know, those livestock are the positions. This man, after he got two daughters, you are cow. You be my cow. You are sheep. <laughs> By the way, because of that, Laban's, you know, schemes and cheating methodologies, somehow Jacob had a hard time for 20 years. Number six, 
Jacob had how many sons when he left his uncle Laban's house? Any answer? Okay, let me go then. All right, Genesis 32, 22 says he had 11 sons. J Joseph was the 11th son of Mr. Jacob. Benjamin was not yet born when he departed from the land. Okay? It's good, yeah? Reviewing the, the book of Genesis with some numbers. Now, Joseph was how many years old when he was sold out as a slave? He was sold by his own brothers. How old was he? Do you know? Any guess? Yes. 17. Wow, that's right. You will get the prize. Genesis 37 verse 2 says, this was the account. You have to read it carefully. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives, but not original wife. Actually, they were the maids. And he brought, Joseph brought their father a bad report about them. <laughs> Definitely, the brothers of Jacob got angry. This guy, 17 year old. By the way, just within seven years, 11 sons were coming out to the world by four ladies. So in other words, they were just almost same age. Imagine within seven years, how many? 11 sons were born into the world. Jacob was busy going into the, this woman, that woman, that woman, and you know, continually giving birth within seven years. That's why the sibling, the almost same age, you know, the brothers, they quarreled each other. Definitely, Joseph got a caught. The next question. Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt when he was how many years old? Yes. 30. Very good. Genesis 32 again. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Very good. Now, 9. Joseph met his brothers and his father, Jacob, when he was how many years old? Any of you? Any of you? Okay, let me give the answer. Joseph met his father and his brothers. Benjamin also arrived, all of the group. It was the second year, he, because he said, for two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will not be plowing or reaping. In other words, according to the dream of the king Pharaoh, which was interpreted by this godly man, Joseph, the first seven years of plentiful harvest was gone. Now the second famine era had come. This was the second year. And another five more years, the land will be no food at all. In other words, seven years passed and two years passed, all in all, nine years passed, and Joseph became prime minister when he was 30 years old. That's why 30 years plus nine, so 39 years. Okay, now number 10. Jacob was how many years old when he met Joseph in Egypt? Maybe you may not know. And when you read the Bible, some of the good numbers, you may re uh, remember this. Jacob was 130 years old. He was asked by King Pharaoh, and he replied, Yes, my life is 130 years. Okay. Jacob died when he was how many years old? He died after 17 years. So somehow his heart has been damaged because of his son's you know, that crooked way of treating his brother. He thought that Joseph was killed by animals. But thankfully, God saved his life, moved him from one place to Egypt, and he became the prime minister. 
So somehow at the end of his life, for 17 years, he was able to spend his life with Joseph. This is the question with the numbers, and I will let me go. Esau got married when he was 40 years old. In other words, Jacob was 40 years old because they were twins. And definitely Isaac is 100 years old. And now, we heard already that Joseph met his father Jacob when he was 39. And after 17 years, his father died. So when at the age of 56, his father died. And now going back, then minus 9, it will be 109, and Isaac would be 181. But according to the Bible, Isaac died when he was 180. So when Joseph became the prime minister, Isaac already died. All right, with this, then you have these numbers, okay, as you trace back. And now, this is the key. Jacob returned home from Uncle Laban's house after six years. The first seven years, he served for Rachel, but he gave Leah. So after they got married, for seven days, he fulfilled because Leah became his wife. And after seven days, the second daughter, Rachel, became his wife. So now he has two wives, okay? And he served another seven years for Rachel. So he served 14 years. And at the end of his 14 years, he got his son, 11th son, Jacob. That's why I told you within seven years, all 11 sons came out to the world, all right? So after 14 years, Joseph was born, and he left his uncle's house after 20 years. That's why when he left Uncle Laban's house, Joseph was six years old. As you count this going back, you can trace back. Six years and seven years and seven years. You see, you look at this. When Jacob ran away, to Uncle Laban from Esau, he was 77-year-old man. Not a young man. You know, I think you, you now have different understanding. You thought that, you know, Esau was trying to kill him, so he just ran away. No. He was quite old, not yet married. As his brother Esau already had two wives from Hittite. This was the history. And of course, that's why he was... Uh, the Isaac was 107, and this was the fulfilling of all the numbers. I think you will study later. Now, we will go into the study of the book of Exodus. I love this book, and you may ask Pastor Sheen, our title is Edge. Why you have chosen this book, book of Exodus? And I told you already, this is the reason for I have chosen this book. This is the edge of the cliff. Okay? There was a French poet by the name of Guillaume Apollinaire. I don't know whether that my pronunciation is correct in French. But anyway, this man is a very famous French poet. And he had a very wonderful and meaningful poem. Let me read this. Come to the edge, he said. We can't. We are afraid, they replied. Come to the edge, he said. We can't. We will fall, they replied. Come to the edge, he said. And so they came. And he pushed them. The last one. And they flew. We know the story of eagle, right? The baby eagles. Now having feathers and growing, you know, getting big size. And trying to get always from the mother's mouth, you know, all the foods. But do we already know the eagle, mother eagle, is now the time you have to fly. You are the king of the air. 
And what? He grabbed the baby bird up there. And what? Shoo! Release. And the baby, oh, mommy, no, 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 oh, oh, I'm dying. And he just came and catched again, went up. Shoo! Again, mommy, are you crazy? I, no, I cannot fly. Over and over again, by training this hardship, finally, the king of the birds, the eagle, is able to fly. Soar up in there, using his natural navigation, you know, the power, looking at all with his good eyesight, and looking at all the priests catching and living. You know, you carefully look at this picture. You know, I love, I got this photo from Google and I thank the Lord for Google. Sometimes I'm thanking for the YouTube. I'm getting so much of good, you know, inspirational videos and photos from there. Look at this. He, of course, he, Jesus, come to the edge. Come to the edge. This, oh, no, we are afraid. You see, all of them are, oh, oh, no, no. No way. We are afraid. We will fall. Come. Finally, they all came. Then all of a sudden, Jesus pushed me. Boom. And finally, they knew that. Oh, I can fly. Yes. Thank you, Jesus, for pushing me away from the cliff. This week, you and I have to understand this experience, flying away from the cliff, coming out of the cage, coming out of the, your comfort zone. You are no longer staying here in you know, AOP and you know, as a what? Son of the pastor and son of the elder, son of the doctor. And, you, know, you are always, you know, it's like a, your boundary. All the years from birth to 23, you are only in AUP person. You need to go out to Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Africa, Angola, many other parts of the world, and proclaim the love of God. You know, this morning I was so much touched by three prayer supporters. The last guy was the one who just prayed for me a while ago. And the other two guys are from Africa. One from Angola and the other one I do not know. But anyway, as I arrived here about 6.55, like that, already he came and, Pastor, I'm so glad to see you and sit down beside of you this morning. I want to pray for you. Is it okay? Of course. Man, he prayed for me. I was so much moved. I've never had this kind of privilege approached by young people and prayed for my preaching ministry. So I think, oh man, where are you from? He said, Angola. And I heard, you know, Angol, Angolan, Angolian people, you know, their original language is Portuguese and they're all African dialects. Then how you, when did you come? Said, oh, three years ago, this is my third year. Then he learned English much, much better than I do. Wow, I said, oh, you young man, you are genius. Approached by our young people and inspired and encouraged by their godly prayer support. I was so much moved and encouraged. I want to say thank you to our beloved uh, students who are praying for me. Remember this, come to the edge. As you come in, edge and the cliff. Don't be afraid. Of course, you will say, oh, no, I'm afraid. Oh, I will fall. But as you come with the faith of Jesus, although Jesus will maybe push you away, but don't worry. God will make you fly away. Amen? All right. I love this picture. You see the one here. Oh, pyramids and Sphinx, you know, all the cities which had been constructed by the power of Israelites. And now we'll quickly go 
the first, you know, what happened after Joseph's life. Here said that Joseph's father, Jacob, and his brothers, all 70 of them, as a one household, they came to the land of Koshan, specialized area for uh, Joseph's family. And the Bible says, but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty. You see, in numbers and in the positions and maybe in the social status, Israel people have become one of the great people in Egypt. And the Bible said, there was a new king. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. You know, the dynasty, they have their own knowledge and tradition. Of course, if you go into the throne, you have to learn all the history of the great empire. Egypt was one of the biggest, largest, strongest country in the world. But now, a new king who had to have all the knowledges, yet his intention was a little bit different. The, you know, actually, the king set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And the Pithom and Ramses, all the supplying cities were constructed by the hands of the Israelites. Why? From the free man, royal prime minister's family, now because of this new king's scheme, the people of Israel became the slavery. And actually the pen of inspiration, the LNG White mentioned this. Let me read, but as time rolled on, the great man to whom Egypt owed so much and the generation blessed by his labors passed to the grave. And there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. You please read carefully this yellow underlined phrase. Not that he was ignorant of Joseph's services to the nation, but he wished to make no recognition of them, and so far as possible, to bury them in oblivion. You see, the king, this new king, intentionally want to destroy all the history of Joseph. Why? Because he was man of Satan. Exodus 1.12 somehow says, but more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Isn't it great that, you know, it, it is very nature, the slaves, you just imagine, if the press is harder, their what? Their powers arose. Well, it's a power game. You can see. But in this time, this new king, he had special idea. Hmm. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. Oh, look at this, ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Day and night, they had to work and work and work whole life you just imagine as you get you know like a nine ten years without going to the school you have to work from that age until 60 65 and die over and over again for several hundred years but in this pressure still god was powerful you know then he said the midwives however feared god and did not do what the king egypt had them to do they left the boys leave and the king called secretly the midwives of the hebrew and they said now this is my order of course the hebrew ladies will not invite what egyptian midwives that's why this new king had a scheme okay in order to kill all the boys they better what bribe the Hebrew ladies, and when he saw the babies are boy, just killed secretly. But the midwives, they feared the Lord. 
and they, they didn't follow the new king's scheme. And as he said here, the people increased and became even more numerous. You see, it was a power game. Satan is now bringing this agenda. And then God said, no. And this new king is another, mm, the bigger and greater plan. Then God said, no. It's like a power game. Finally, now the new king of Egypt, he's now giving a public order. No longer secret order to only the Hebrew midwives, but this time he proclaimed to the, all the nation. Now, if you look at the people, oh, again, this. Okay. You don't need to show my <laughs> Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. What? What was that? Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. But let every girl leave. In other words, the Egyptian king, he wants to totally destroy the kingdom. In this very critical moment, a man and a woman married. They were the Levites, chosen tribe. And from these godly parents, a baby came. And for three months somehow, they tried to hide the baby. You know, whenever the baby is crying, <laughs> close the mouth. And somehow they were able to handle this baby, crying baby. Babies are crying all the time, right? For three months, but no longer they were able to hide this. So, what happened? We already know the story. To the bank of the Nile, put the innocent and made a basket and put the baby in and they flew. This. And this time, God provided somebody who was from the royal family of the king's family. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. Because at the time, all ladies, they believed that if they took a shower in the Nile, they will be blessed. So this lady went there. And her attendants were walking along the river bank. Don't you think that it's a God's providence and guidance, you know, guiding them to the going around? And, and they saw something. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is the one of the Hebrews' babies, she said. Someone who already know all the story, all the propaganda and all the public decrees from his own royal family, King Pharaoh. If you see the babies, Hebrew boys, kill them or throw them to the Nile River. Let them drown and die. But from the very family of the King Pharaoh, the Satan's what? Servant. God provide a woman who has a fear, who has a compassionate love for the baby. And finally, you know what? She took this little baby. And now, the Bible said she took the baby and the sister Miriam was there and again returned back to the home and brought his mother back. And you look at here. He said, I will give the money. I will pay you. You know, Moses was raised by the money from the Pharaoh king's money and the food, milk, dress and everything even the you know what maids and servants from king's house isn't it great our god is much powerful than satan that's why he became his son and he got named moses i draw through him out of the water as i conclude this morning i hope you to get this image not this image Sorry, I'm moving here. This image. Can you see this side? Please show this. Yes. Okay, everybody. Okay. Look at this. Muscle. Wow. Satan looks much better. Wow. Stronger. More muscular than Jesus because 
His inner power is hidden by the dress of the righteousness. Oops. Uh, you see, he's angry. Oh, Jesus, your sons. Because Satan knew that through this family line, Jesus, the Messiah, Savior, will come. That's why he wants to destroy. He wants to disconnect this family line. And finally, there will be no Messiah, no Savior, and he will be the king of this world forever and ever. But our king, Jesus Christ, who is much, much stronger than Satan, he said, you Satan, you are one of the creatures, but I am the creator. You got one third of a heavenly angel host, but I got two third. Whom are you going to belong to? Today, Satan's schemes, a new king's scheme is great and powerful. Yet, our God's protection and his guidance and his uh, blessings upon us is much, much greater than Satan's. So this morning, you choose. You choose which way you will be. Of course, I always want to choose Jesus because he is much greater than Satan. As we go to the journey for the book of Exodus, from this land to the land of Canaan, from this earth to a heavenly bound, you and I will learn how majesty and how powerful and how strong our God is. May the Lord bless you as you go to the classes and preparing your wonderful professional future for the service of God. This is my prayer this morning with the title, Turning the Tide. May God bless us all. Thank you. Strengthen your 
thank you, thank you, sister. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this morning we are so grateful to listen to the message from you, Lord. You are inviting us to the edge of the cliff. Come, my children, come to the edge. But we said we can't, we are afraid, we will fall. But you continually inviting us to the edge of the cliff. My son, my daughter, come to the edge. And finally, we are standing at the edge of the cliff. And we know that you will push us to the world. You will push us to the downfall of the, our comfort zone. We need to come out of the cage. We need to come out of our own comfort zone. If we do not meet you personally yet, oh, Father God, this week must be the one we will meet you personally. Sinner, Savior, Son, Father. Father, we'd like to thank you for this blessed moment as we now go out to the classes and enjoy our friendship and wonderful studies today. Give them heavenly wisdom. Treat them as your beloved and sweet, precious children on earth so that we will glorify you. And in the afternoon again, we will meet one more time for spiritual food. It is my humble prayer for AUP students. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, thank you, thank you.